Well, good morning. It is a joy to see you guys this morning. I appreciate Enoch telling his story as a young adult here at Grace, what it looks like to find and follow Jesus. And so we're grateful to get to worship with you guys this morning. We're going to be continuing in our series this morning through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 3, we're going to pick it up this morning in verse 10. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. As you guys are turning there, uh, let me just say it, especially some of you guys that are graduating here, either December or May, that might be thinking about full-time vocational ministry as we announce our fellows program this morning. Let me just to say a couple things to y'all. You may not realize this, but for Blake and I, we both have a part, an investment we get to play in our fellows program. Uh, probably one of Blake's favorite parts of his job is that every Monday he has an opportunity to teach our fellows in class. And then for myself as one of our co-directors of the fellows program, I, I love the opportunity that we have as a local body to help men and women who are thinking about full-time vocational ministry sort through where God is leading them and what God has for them. And so if that's something you're thinking about, please come join us for lunch today. Pizza, it's free. Come join for that, all right? Uh, we'd love to see you guys. Philippians chapter 3, pick it up in verse 10. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 10, Paul tells us that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Why don't you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity this morning that we have together around it. I pray, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would challenge us, that you'd stretch us. I pray in the midst of so many of the things that we pursue and some of the different things that are on our plates, Lord, I pray this morning that you would, in some senses, take us back to the basics of what it looks like to walk with you, to know you, uh, that you would remove the crowded complexity sometimes of what we think the spiritual life to be, Lord, and that you would allow us to center in on what's major. Lord, I pray you'd allow us to hear your voice this morning, that you would guide, that you would teach, that you would lead us just as you see fit. Lord, we ask for these things this morning through your Son and by your Spirit, we pray. Amen. Well, it was about 12 years ago that my wife and I were living in China, and she elected and decided for her that one of her life bucket goals would be to run a full marathon. I'm an individual who believes a fun run is a complete antinomy and a lie, okay? I hate running, okay? And so her election to do a full-time or full marathon I thought was awesome and amazing, but I was going to be on the sideline as her cheerleader, okay? And so as we would kind of, she would train for months, and as we would get to that fateful day and a cold morning in January in Shanghai, China, uh, there were several things that would unfold that day that I didn't anticipate. Some things that would unfold that you would think would have embarrassed me, but they didn't. Some things that would unfold that... I'd never anticipated, and they were horribly embarrassing. The things that occurred that didn't embarrass me that you might think would have embarrassed me were these. First of all, you have to understand that my plan for her 26-mile marathon was to take a series of taxis or Ubers around town to show up at different spots along the race to show her and encourage her to give her some water and a banana. That was my plan. So I had no guilt or no shame that she was running on foot 26 miles while I would kind of pop around by taxis and Ubers all day long. I had no problem with that. I also had no problem with the fact that at the first stop, as she's been running for about an hour, it was a cold morning. My ears were freezing, and I just decided while she stopped, I would ask if I could have her headband. She didn't need it. She was warm. And so for the next the rest of the day, I wore an incredibly girly headband just to keep my ears warm, and I had no problem with that, okay? Also, uh, you may not realize this, and, and I, you might think I would have been shamed by this, but I wasn't. I, I spent way more time dreaming, fantasizing even a little bit about the fact that I just wish I would have brought a chair that day, all right? It was six hours on my feet. I spent a lot of time dreaming about getting a foot massage, just like getting warm, like my feet were just pounding as the one not running the marathon. None of that bothered me whatsoever. There were two things that really did get to me, though, that day, and they were this. First of all, I hadn't planned on the audience that was going to be joining me as I came to the sidelines for the marathon. This isn't sexist. This isn't meant to be gender specific or anything, but it's just a pure statistical thing. The number of wives, women, girlfriends, sisters, moms, and grandmas that were on the sideline rearing, uh, cheering on their men, while I, as one of the few men cheering on his women, was just profoundly shameful, okay? <laughs> to such a level that I began to think about in my mind, do I fabricate some story about a horrible ACL tear that occurred last week, right? 
how do I communicate why I'm not running with my woman out there, all right? Second of all, the thing I didn't imagine was I thought through I was going to show up at six different spots on this race, but I didn't think about the finish line whatsoever. All of my planning, all of my thoughts were about these different spots, and so I had no signage, I had no party, I had no plan for the moment that she would hit the finish line. I I didn't thought about it at all. Thankfully, there would be five Chinese friends that would show up with us, and they would actually run alongside of her the last five miles because they were thinking about the fact that that's the hardest part of the race. And then as we got to the end of the race, at the finish line itself, there were literally, no doubt, about 100 Chinese grandmothers and 100 Chinese grandfathers, all with tambourines, all saying in Chinese, jai yo, jai yo, which literally means add oil. I didn't understand it, but it was awesome. It was just awesome, okay? And so they're cheering, and she crosses the finish line. It was this great moment. She finishes the race. The sense of satisfaction was awesome, but I didn't at all think about the audience that I would join, nor did I think about the finish line in any way, shape, or form. Why do I share that? Because this morning, as we jump into Philippians chapter 3, Paul is going to liken the spiritual life to a marathon, and the first thing that he's going to do, unlike what I did that fateful day, was he's going to bring all of the focus, all of our energy to the finish line. Notice what he says in verse 10 as we jump into this passage is he's going to liken, again, the spiritual life to a marathon. And the first thing that he's going to do as he comes out of the gate is he's going to focus all of our attention on the finish line. Before we jump into verse 10, though, it might be helpful, especially if you were with us last week or if you weren't with us last week, because what Paul will do in the beginning part of chapter 3 is he's going to essentially lay out uh, the qualifications for the starting line of this marathon. What he's going to do in the beginning part of chapter three is lay out for you and I, what are the qualifications to show up at the starting line for this marathon that we've now entered into that we're called to run? If you were with us last week, you'll remember, as Paul said in verse nine, chapter three, if you let me remind you, verse nine, he says, and that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ and the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. What Paul is saying in chapter 3, verse 9, is that you and I entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that we entered into a spiritual marathon, so to speak, in which our qualifying sprint or our qualifying time had nothing to do with what we had ever done in our life before, but it was based on the qualifying time of Jesus Christ. In fact, he says in verse 5, it's not just that which he accomplished prior, but in verse 5, he says it's also regarding his lineage. None of it mattered. He says in verse 5, that I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. What Paul is saying in the very beginning part of chapter 3 is that as we think about our spiritual life as a marathon, the fact that you and I show up at the starting blocks of that marathon to begin with has absolutely nothing to do with our own accomplishments, our own lineage, our own abilities whatsoever. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us and on our behalf and the righteousness specifically which he has extended to us. We begin a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith based on the righteousness of God that has been secured and credited to our account. And so as we begin to think about the spiritual life, what Jesus or what Paul will do here in verse 10 is quickly move us from the starting line all the way now to the finish line. He's going to give us a description of what the finish line looks like as we think about the spiritual life as a marathon. Notice what he says, verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. That as Paul thinks about the spiritual life as a marathon, what he envisions as he describes the finish line is a lifelong pursuit that the finish line is such that what it's all about, the reason why we're in the race to begin with, is that we would know Jesus Christ, the power of his resurrection, and that we would have an opportunity to share in his sufferings and be conformed to him and have a conformity and a likeness to who he is. Why did Jesus Christ save you? Why is he not taking you home right now? It's that you would know Jesus Christ, that you would share in his sufferings, and that you would know the power of Christ. Why is it you're still here? It's all about that, that you would know Christ, that you would be known by him. And so what Paul does is he begins to help us begin to see our spiritual life as a marathon, is that he's going to bring all of our focus and all of our energy on the finish line and say, this is what it's all about. Singularly, that we would know him. I love the way that David puts it in Psalm chapter 27, verse 4, when he says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. 
David, who was him who was after God's own heart. I love David's prayer here. I love that which he pins here. The idea that that which consumed David, that which was his chief objective, was to sit and to know God and to behold his beauty and his radiance. In the midst of all the things that were on David's plates, in the midst of all the requirements that were upon him as the king of the nation, that which drove him most, that which was his greatest desire and passion and ambition, was to sit and to know God. It's interesting, I think, as we think about the spiritual life as a marathon, I want to pose a couple questions to you guys, because I I think for me, as I was thinking through this passage this week, a, a few questions really hit me, and that's this. If you were to think about your walk and your relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to simply ask you, what drives you more? A desire and a need for intimacy with him or a desire and a motive for productivity for him? What drives you more? Put it a different way. Are you driven more by a devotion of him or for production for him? Months and months ago, Blake told me that his brother was getting married on this weekend, and he asked me if I could preach for him. I said, sure, that sounds great. Put November 11th on the calendar. I said, hey, could you at least tell me what passage it is? He tells me what passage it is. I said, great. It wasn't until this week that I started to look at the passage, and you ever had that moment with the Lord where you're like, oh, dear, right? <laughs> oh, so the, all the passages, this is the one you had for me, Lord. Fantastic, all right. Why? Because these two questions were squeezing me all week. To be really honest with you, as I think about my life, as I think about what drives me, there is a much greater and palpable desire and drive to be productive for him than there is to be intimate with him. There is a much stronger, concrete feeling and drive to produce for him than to necessarily be devoted to him. And yet for Paul, as he looks at the finish line of the spiritual life, he says, here, here is the goal. Here is what it's all about. It's to have a relational intimacy with Jesus Christ so that we know him and are known by him. That's where we're shooting. That's where we're headed. And yet I think for so many of us, there is something different in the way that we function. There's something different in the way that we walk. And for me, this passage started off incredibly inspiring and ended up incredibly challenging because I don't do this well. I don't do this well. It is an intimacy with him that most drives me. It's often a desire and a productivity for him that drives me. How about you? If you know Jesus Christ this morning, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I just want to ask you, what is it that drives you to continue to pursue him and continue to walk with him? What is it? Put it a different way, let me ask you simply this. that I think for many of us, there is a choice that we have to make that you and I have to be willing to choose to stop, to be still, and to sit with him. The reality is, I think about my own life is, for both my wife and I, there are a set of responsibilities that have come on us, both professionally and personally, that are the highest they've ever been in our lives. The, the ability to stop has gotten harder than it's ever been. The ability to be still and to be quiet has only seemed like it gets harder and harder. Even this morning, I was waiting on the coffee to brew. I wanted to spend some time with the Lord. My phone was in my pocket, so what am I doing? Why am I on my phone and not praying? <laughs> right? What is the deal? And then my kids now, they're staying up later and later. They're also still getting up early still, <laughs> right? There's not a lot of quiet time anymore in my home. There's not a lot of solitary alone time anymore. It is loud. It is constant. It is just constantly moving. It's gotten harder and harder in my life, and I would submit probably in y'all's as well, to stop, to be still, and to sit. And so we choose to pursue productivity instead of intimacy because this seems a lot easier to manufacture and get done. And yet, when you and I begin to move in that place, is the reason why Paul starts it to say the finish line begins with a desire to know him that secondarily leads to the desire to know his, the power of his resurrection. See, I, I think relational intimacy always leads to spiritual vitality. It starts with an intimacy knowledge of who he is that then leads to an experience of his power that then leads into productivity and the ability to bear fruit and to walk with Jesus Christ. So I, uh, I think Christ puts it this way in John chapter 15. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who abides in, uh, in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. John chapter 15, verse 4 to 5 absolutely critical and pivotal passage that helps us to begin to grasp over and over again 
that where does spiritual vitality come from? It comes from an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Relational intimacy always precedes spiritual vitality. It always does. You can have activity, but it may not be vitality unless you have an intimacy with Jesus Christ. Productivity and activity are easy to make happen. Intimacy and vitality are a whole different thing. How is it for you? What is it that drives your walk with Jesus Christ? How is it that you pursue Jesus Christ? I think when you and I begin to grasp that these things are a reality, then I think you and I have an opportunity to begin to sort through exactly where we are in our spiritual marathon. When we have a sense of where the starting line is and we have a sense of what the finish line looks like, then we have an opportunity to evaluate our present direction. Where are we running towards? Notice how Paul puts it here in beginning in verse 12. Notice what he says as we begin to think about the movement toward the finish line. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I have laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He says, look, I know I'm not at the finish line. I know I haven't arrived at that place that I know Jesus Christ, the power of his resurrection. I'm continually shooting for that. So I'm moving in that direction. Verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is a sense in which Paul is highlighting our spiritual life as a marathon that you see a movement for Paul, a movement toward the finish line to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection. And yet I think that running is often not what is hard. What's really hard is sometimes is knowing how to run in the right direction. Um, I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys football fan. Pray for me. It's been rough this fall, which is why I've put all of my athletic football hopes upon my six-year-old child at this point in life, Okay. Which is also why I know it's not a very healthy pattern as a parent, but here's where I am, okay? And so he had his first ever football season as a dude. He's six, he's six years old. He's in kindergarten. He's playing flag football. And so I'm stoked. This is going to be great. Uh, as you would expect with kindergartners who are playing flag football, this isn't like an aerial assault. They're not like opening up the playbook, going four receivers wide, right? It is just wishbone offense, handoff, 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 okay? And so he gets his jersey, and it's number 21, which happens to be my the best player on the Dallas Cowboys, Zeke Elliott. So I'm beginning to have visions because God just made it happen with the 21 number, right? Uh, That he's going to tote the rock, that he's going to take it to the house, and then he's going to pile up touchdown after touchdown in his first game. That's kind of where I am. This is how I'm processing the Dallas Cowboys season, okay? This is where I am. And so we get to the first game. I got my phone out. We're ready to go. And he has his first carry. He's in the backfield. And the quarterback hands him the ball. And the defense comes at him. And what does he do? He takes off running. Great, running's not hard, right? But he runs in the complete opposite direction, all right? (laughs) He's running from sideline to sideline by the entire time going completely backwards. By the time he's done with the play, he's not only fumbled the ball, we'll work on that, but he's gone 30 yards absolutely backwards, okay? So I got a video of it. So I sit down with him after the game. I say, hey, dude, bud, great job. Man, you ran hard. You ran really hard. I mean, you ran so hard, no one could catch you. But you ran in the complete opposite direction, dude, right? You're supposed to go that way. Why are you going that way, man? And so he's like, they're after me. I was like, I know they're after you. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you're supposed to go around them and go through them, right? They can't touch you. You're huge. Come on, man. Let's do this, all right? That was our post-game conversation, right? Why do I say that? Uh, To mock my son? No, all right? Uh, But to say, I I think for us, even as we think about the spiritual life, running is often not the hard part. The hard part is running in the right direction, right? Right? I want to ask you as you think about the pursuit to know Jesus Christ, the pursuit to know his power, even in his sufferings, what direction are you running this morning? Are you even in the race at all? Are you even running at all? Honestly, as I was thinking about this passage and thinking about our own race, I feel like there's a whole set of reasons why we often can at times not run in the right direction. I think for many of us, suffering can frankly just discourage us to such, an expo- such a place that we begin to think, maybe the race is just too hard, right? Defenders are coming at my boy. This is just too hard. I'm out and I go the other direction, right? But sometimes suffering, as it grinds on us and as we struggle through it and as we grieve, sometimes suffering gets us to a place that we begin to ask the question, is the race too hard? <laughs> Do I even want to stay in this race? Sometimes I think for many of us, distractions can detour us. And sometimes those distractions are good things, Right? like productivity or ministry or the pursuit to know and care for our family or whatever it may be. But sometimes distractions, whether they're good or bad, can detour us and point us in a different direction. And often I think we begin to think, well, maybe the race just isn't that compelling because why not I just chase after something else? 
For some of us, I think uh, responsibilities can cause us to drift away. We wake up thinking, hey, here's what I got to do today. Here's what I got to do today. Here's the thing that's on me. I feel like it's all bearing over me and weighing me down. And so we get to a place where the relational intimacy with the Lord we have, the space that we create to sit, to be quiet, and to listen begins to erode away. And we stay in motion, but we've lost the foundation and the base to be in motion in a godly manner, in a manner that honors the Lord, in a manner that has real vitality and real power, There's motion, but there's not real strength to that motion. And for some of us, I think sin can deceive us, and we end up out of bounds and injured and either unable to get back in the race or just too shameful and too embarrassed to get back in the race. Where are you this morning? As you think about running and a pursuit to know Jesus Christ, where are you this morning? Are you running forward or are you resting backwards? There are times, as I think about my college experience, where there was an amount of time, there was a richness of what I was learning, a richness of my time with the Lord, that I often look back on college and wonder if it'll ever be like that. So for you guys that are in college, let me just say, don't miss the season that you're in. Don't miss the opportunity that provides you to sit, to have ample time, to know Christ, to learn in the Word, to be challenged, to have all kinds of opportunity to serve. But even as I look back, I often think back, well, I walked with Him well in the past, And so it all begins to hollow out. I walk with him right now. Will I walk with him well now? Or am I going to rest backwards on what has been in the past? Well, for some of us that are running, again, let me just ask, what direction are you running? Are you running and chasing other things that are lesser things? Or are you singularly focused on chasing and knowing Jesus Christ, the power of his resurrection, a relational intimacy that leads to a spiritual vitality? Is that where you are? If you're honest with yourself, where are you? Again, like I said, I think this passage started out for me incredibly inspiring, and then it got incredibly challenging, because in some ways, I think Philippians 3 is kind of a back to the basics. Let's wipe out all the complexity of spirituality. Let's walk, wipe out all of the theology and get back down to just the basics of, do you want to know Christ and pursue Christ and be found in him in a relationship with him as the chief marker of your life? the chief foundation piece of your life, or have you gotten distracted with other trappings and other things that go along with it that you miss the core? Philippians 3 is kind of a back to the basics moment for a lot of us. It's a back to the X's and O's, back to a whiteboard as to, hey, are we pursuing Christ or are we pursuing something else? Last thing here that Paul will do for us as we think about uh, this spiritual life as a marathon is that he's going to move us from the finish line and just thinking about it and being focused on it to actually how do we arrive at that finish line. He's going to move us to a place that I didn't do for Marcy. He's going to move us to the finish line and help us envision what's going to happen. Notice again verse 11. We didn't read through this. We went right past it. But notice what he says as he begins to move us toward the idea of the finish line itself and how we arrive. He says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I think what Paul is going to do here in in verse 12 and 11 is begin to highlight not just focusing on the finish line as a clarity as to what we're pursuing and if we're running in the right direction, but he's going to begin to envision for us what we're going to experience when we arrive there. And specifically, I think he's going to call us to chase a reward. And here's how he does in verse 11. He says, if some translations will say, some translations will say, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The commentators will struggle with verse 11. They'll wrestle with verse 11. What is Paul saying here? Paul, who talked about the resurrection in countless other passages, is Paul saying somehow that the resurrection from the dead is a conditional reality that's not guaranteed? Is that what he's saying? Because if he is saying that, it sounds very different than everything else he says in every other passage that he's talking about the resurrection that seems absolutely unconditional, attached to our exercise of faith and our being sealed by the Spirit till a day in which we'll be redeemed. So what's Paul saying here in verse 11? Some translations will say, and we'll translate it, if somehow. Also interesting to know in verse 11 that he talks about the resurrection from the dead. That There's a Greek word being used here for resurrection that is used nowhere else in our New Testament. This is the only place and the only time in which we see this phrase for resurrection, which is literally an out-resurrection, or it's a resurrection out from the dead. It's a different idea than we see elsewhere. I think most simply put, what Paul is saying here, if we were to translate it, is he's speaking of a better resurrection. A better resurrection that's conditional and attached to how we walk and how we live. What Paul is trying to help his audience do is to think not just about crossing the finish line, but crossing the finish line in such a way that we win the race and we win the prize. 
Paul said it similarly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you guys to f- keep your finger here in Philippians and flip over real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Pick it up in verse 24. And notice what Paul says, speaking of the same athletic imagery in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says this, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, verse 26, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. Verse 27, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. In college, we took portions of that section and put it up on like a big poster above our uh, exit to our front of our apartment. So we'd go running and we'd hit, hit it like it was like a locker room inspirational sign before we went and worked out, okay? As if that was somehow going to motivate us, all right? But what's the idea? Back when I used to like to run, okay? So what was the idea, though? The idea was Paul is saying, look, there's a backdrop as he thinks about the spiritual life as to an athletic venue in which in the Panhellenic Games, these guys would compete with incredible discipline, incredible self-control. And it wasn't just to cross the finish line and finish, but it was to cross the finish line and win. And to receive a prize that the emperor who would have been in, in appearance would have come down out of the stands and bestowed upon the neck of the victorious athlete. What Paul is doing for us in 1 Corinthians 9 and what he's doing for us here in Philippians 3 is highlighting that the resurrection for all of us, if we know Jesus Christ, is absolutely guaranteed. But he's turning the corner to say there's something else beyond the resurrection that comes for those of us that finish the race well, that run hard, that in some cases even suffer and experience martyrdom. There's an extra reward, an extra prize on top of finishing and just finishing. It was interesting, even as Marcy ran her marathon that, uh, a couple years ago or 12 years ago, it was crazy. I began to watch because they had like a bus that would come, okay? And so if there was a certain amount of time that you could finish the marathon, and if you didn't finish in that amount of time, the slow bus would literally pick you up, okay? And, and so it was horribly shameful and embarrassing, okay? Marcy finished all on her own, praise the Lord, okay? Uh, but the slow bus would come, and so you'd have some who wouldn't actually even be able to finish the race, But to finish the race six hours into it or to finish the race three hours into it, there's an incredible difference, right? That moment and what it felt like to finish cross the finish line if you finished first. A prize would come. A war acclamation would come. And so what Paul is saying for you and I as we think about our spiritual life, we think about the different challenges that come, is that there's a reward for finishing well, for pursuing Christ hard, for enduring suffering and not pulling back. And we so often don't talk about that. That's, I think, what Paul is trying to bring out here, which is why he continues on. Notice what he says in verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I think for you and I, as we think about the spiritual life as a marathon, the reality is in each of our lives, if the prize is compelling enough, we will do just about anything. One of my favorite movies was a 1997 documentary called Hands on a Hard Body. I'd suggest you not Google hands on a hard body. If you're going to Google it, do a 1997 documentary, hands on a hard body, all right? Because here's the deal. It was an annual marketing gimmick of a Nissan dealership, and what they would do every single year was give away a hard body truck. And the movie details this annual marketing gimmick because what they would have is they'd have contestants that would literally have to put their hands on a hard body, and the last one to finally pull their hand off would be the one who won the hard body truck, Okay. But the hilarity of it was you had these people from crazy in the woods, East Texas, all right? And you add about 72 hours of sleep deprivation onto it, and they are hilarious, all right? And so what would happen, the rules of the competition were you would have every hour, you would have a five-minute break. Every six hours, you would have a 15-minute break. And so these contestants had to make a choice often in the slow amount of time they had as to whether they were going to eat in that moment, whether they were going to sleep in that moment, or whether they were going to go to the bathroom in that moment. But their options were pretty limited, and their time even more limited. But what was crazy would be you would have absolute sleep deprivation ensuing on these individuals who were exhausted because they hadn't slept, they hadn't set, they barely had any food, all right? And they would do anything just to hang in for a free hard body truck. See, when the reward is compelling enough, you and I will do anything, even sleep deprivation, right? If the reward is compelling enough. I think for many of us, as we think about our lives, if we think about our chase and know Christ, I think many of us have chased other things or we've pulled back, we're not running hard because we're not that convinced that it's that compelling of a prize. If we're just honest, 
Why is it we're chasing other things? Why is it distractions can detour us? Why is it that suffering can discourage us? Why is it that sin can so deceive us that we get completely off course and out of bounds? Maybe we're just not that convinced that it's that compelling and that worthwhile. And yet what Paul will say here in Philippians 3 is, let's get away from all of the complexities, all of the trappings, and there's one thing that ought to drive us. There's one thing that is the most valuable pursuit of our entirety of our lives, and it's to know Christ to know the power of his resurrection and to be conformed into his likeness. Everything else is just rock and roll. Everything else is just sideshow business, right? And so for so many of us, if you're like me, that have a pursuit for productivity for him and not intimacy with him, we have it completely off and completely off base. My challenge for you this morning is simple. It's to take the discipline and to create spaces and to create moments this afternoon, this week, and to begin to rebuild a pattern if it's eroded in your life, to create space to be still, to sit, and to listen and to follow. Everything else is just trappings. Everything else is just rock and roll. This is the thing. This is the thing. Last thing I want you guys to see before we wrap up this morning is that it's not just our thing by ourselves, but it is a team sport. This marathon is not an individual run, but it is a team sport because there's a relay team involved. Because notice how the pronouns shift in verses 15 to 16. Notice what Paul says, verses 15 to 16. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you, which I think is just a complete backhand, right? (laughs) Why would you have a different attitude, right? Verse 16. However, let us keep living by that same standard by which we have attained. Notice how the pronouns shift. Verses 10 all the way to 14, I, 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 I. Verses 15 and 16, us, 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 we. Simply put, as you think about running the spiritual life as a race, are you running? If you are running, what direction are you running? And then lastly, I just ask you this. Are you running alone or are you running with a relay team? Are you running alone or are you running with a relay team? You weren't designed to run alone. If you're running hard and you're running alone, you probably won't run long. You were designed to run as a relay team to chase the Lord, to know the Lord, and to not run this race by yourself. I want to highlight a few things that exist here at Grace Bible Church to help you run that race together, some of them which we announced this morning. Uh, We announced our prepare event because ultimately we're trying to create an environment and a community for you women to connect meaningfully with one another. If you've been a part of Grace Bible Church here for a little while and you still haven't found community, prepare is probably one of the best ways for you adult ladies to connect, to connect with one another, to find community, and to begin to run this race as a relay team. For you college students, I love that you're here in our main service, but I want to highlight our college ministry to you guys because ultimately, as you sit in here every single Sunday in the main service, it is more likely that you would run the race as a solo unit than if you were to jump into our college ministry that exists with uh, teaching, with worship, and then ultimately breaks into table groups that are going to process through a sermon because they're going to build community on a Sunday morning with one another, and they're going to build connections meaningfully weekly with an adult family here at Grace. If you're a college student here and you're trying to run the race solo, and you haven't found community, you haven't found some people to do life with, welcome for you to keep coming back, but I'd say you might want to check out our college ministry across the street because they're designed in such a way that you're not going to have an easy time trying to figure out how to do this by yourself. It's easy to walk in and here and walk right out of here and no one connect with you and no one draw you deeper in community. It's really difficult to make that happen over at Consol, which is why we built it the way we built it because we want you to have an opportunity to find community and to be brought into community. Last thing I'd say, if you've not yet found a Bible study, we have home groups that exist all throughout the week. Julie White and myself will help you find a home group that might fit you and fit your needs. And so if you've not found community, if you've not found people yet to run the race with alongside of, you weren't designed to do it alone. And if you're trying to do it alone, you won't do it alone for long. To find community, run it with someone else, share the load and run with each other because we were designed for community as we pursue Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for your grace. Lord, that we so often get distracted with lesser things, that we so often chase after other things. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would take us back to basics. You'd help us to remember that what you've singularly called us to is not productivity for you, but intimacy with you. That what you desire more from us than any other thing is that we would know you, that we would be intimately connected to you. That we would not be busy for you, but that we would be calm and quiet with you. And I pray that you would remove that pressure, that you would remove that lie for what it is, Lord, and that you would create space for us and create a willingness in us to stop 
to put our phones away, to put the demands away, and to listen to your voice and to move deeper into relationship with you. Not looking back on where we've been or how we've walked with you in the past, but looking forward as to what you're calling us to go, to go deeper with you, even deeper still. Lord, we ask for these things this morning through your Son, by your Spirit, we pray. Amen.